my supply, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know. You're my, my reward worth living for, still more awesome than I know. All of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough You're my sacrifice of greatest price, still more awesome than I know. You are coming, King, you are everything, still more awesome than I know, and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than enough more than all i want more than all i need you are more than enough for me more than all i know more than all i can say you are more than enough and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you let's sing that again and all of you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all i have in you is more than Be 
thou my battle shield sword for the fight be thou my dignity thou my delight thou my soul shelter and thou my high tower raise thou me heaven O power of power riches I heed not nor man's empty praise thou mine now and always thou and thou only and first in my heart I King of heaven I treasure thou art High King of There is a hill I cherish Where stood a precious tree The emblem of salvation The gift of Calvary How is it I should profit While he is crucified Yet as his life was taken So I was granted mine My wealth is in the cross There's nothing more I want Than just to know His love My heart is set on Christ And I will count all else as loss The greatest of my crowns Means nothing to me now For I count it up the cross And my, oh, my wealth is in the cross I will not boast in riches I have no pride in gold but I will boast in Jesus and in his name alone my wealth is in the cross there's nothing more i want than just to know his love my heart is set on christ and i will count all else as loss the greatest of my crowns 
means nothing to me now for i counted up the cross and all my wealth is in the cross and when i stand in glory my crown's before the lord let this be my confession my wealth is in the cross my wealth is in the cross there's nothing more i want than just to know his love my heart is set on Christ and I will count all else as loss the greatest of my crowns means nothing to me now for I counted up the cross and all my wealth is in the cross there's nothing more I want than just to know his love my heart is set on Christ and I will count all else as loss the greatest of my crowns means nothing to me now for I counted up the cost and all my wealth is in the cross and all my wealth is in the cross
While the kids are leaving, let's all stand together as we hear God's word. This morning we're looking at Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. Please listen as I read. God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your field and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning we have the opportunity to touch on a very difficult topic in church and that is on tithing. You may notice a pattern where Pastor Dennis always assigns me the difficult passages. I have noticed this pattern. I don't think it's an accident. Tithing is a difficult topic because money is a difficult topic. And I want to begin by giving you all a disclaimer. The first thing I want to point out is our church, it's a little hot, could you lower it? Our church does not have a doctrine of tithing. What I mean by that is Pastor Dennis, Pastor Guang, and I, and the elders of the church, have not come to a single consensus on what exactly tithing is supposed to look like. Uh, Let me give you a quick idea of what the field looks like. Uh, You you have people who would say that tithing should be exactly like you see it in the Old Testament law, a literal tenth of everything that you have, all of your assets, everything. Gross, not net. And then, of course, you have a spectrum as you move on. Oh, no, gross is too much. Let's call it net. Oh, no, that's too much. And then you have the entire opposite end of the spectrum, which is tithing was only a practice for Israel. Therefore, it has no bearing on us whatsoever. All three of us fall somewhere in the middle on that spectrum. My goal today is actually not to tell you the specifics of tithing. I'm going to stay away from that. My goal for you this morning is to explain the principles of our passage for its original context, and then suggest some principles that should affect how we view not just money, but ourselves. One of the big concepts that I would like for all of you to get this morning is that tithing is not about money. Tithing is about worship. Tithing is about faith. And I'm going to make this point again in a more dramatic way later, but I'm going to tell you right now because it's very important. God doesn't care about your money. God wants you. God doesn't care about your money. God wants you. The main idea for this morning is give God everything that belongs to him. That is the main idea, and it also happens to be the title of today's message. Give God everything that belongs to him. And I want to explore this idea and unpack it for you in three headings. So we're going to step through this passage a little bit out of order, but I promise I'll be as clear as possible. The first idea that I want for us to think about is in verse 8. Stop, thief. Verse 8, God brings an indictment, an accusation against Israel. He says in verse 8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And God answers, in your tithes and contributions. See, the thing is, the people were withholding tithes. Under law, as I alluded to earlier, they were legally required to give God a tenth of their assets. Every year. That was the regular tithe. Uh, In case you didn't know, the word English word tithe comes from the Hebrew idea, which is actually a literal one tenth. That's what the tithe is. But the people were withholding the tithe. Most likely, it's because they were not well off. Uh, I'm being polite. 
not, not well off is the nice way of saying it. They were actually doing very, very badly. Remember that these were exiles. They just came back from Babylon. They were trying to restart farms and do whatever they could to build a living for themselves, but things weren't going well. And as we go through the passage, you find out that even as they're trying to grow things and plant things, it's not going well either. And God will explain that later. But as a consequence of not feeling like they have enough, they have decided to withhold the tithe. Whether they just didn't give any tithe at all, or they only gave less than one-tenth what they were legally required to give according to the Mosaic law, we don't know. All we know is that they were withholding it. And I know that the word that God chooses seems severe. He says, rob. I, I, let me tell you, the Hebrew word is correctly translated here. It means rob. Uh, stealing doesn't require taking by force. You can just kind of steal something, something without someone noticing. To rob someone means to take it by force, to take it out of their hands. God says they're robbing him. It implies that they are taking what is not their own by force. And in order to understand why God chooses such a severe word as rob, I want to explain what stewardship is. This is the only way that we can actually understand what's going on. So let's talk about stewardship. Here are four things that you need to know. The first is God is the creator. And because he's the creator, he owns everything. Now, this does not mean that we don't own things legally in our country. We do if you, you know, legally own stuff. Uh, same with Israel. There is ownership, but final ownership belongs to God because God created everything, so God owns everything. But out of everything that he created, he does entrust things to his people as stewards. Now, a steward is what you could call a manager. It's like you, you put it in their responsibility, and it's their responsibility to take care of it and do the right thing with it. You can remember the parable of the talents. When the master goes away on a long journey, and he has three servants, and he entrusts a very large amount of money to each one of them as a steward. So they're responsible to take care and use whatever the master has entrusted to them. That's the dynamic. Whatever you and I have, God has entrusted to us as a stewardship. And let me clarify this. When I say whatever we have, I mean whatever we have. This is not just about money. This is about your health, your body, your opportunities, your job, your education, everything that you have, your relationships, your hair, all of it, whatever you have left of it. All of it is a stewardship from God. None of it actually belongs to you. All of it is entrusted to you. And the thing about God is he is a very gracious master because, number three, he lets you enjoy them. He lets you enjoy the good things that you get to steward. It's not just take care of it, but you can't have any of it. The nice thing about the Christian theology of stewardship is that we understand that even the food that we eat every day does not belong to us, but God lets us enjoy these things. This is this dynamic of stewardship where God entrusts things to us, and actually we get to enjoy them as we take care of them. This is why you can go out to eat. You can buy clothes that look nice. You can buy uh, Tears of the Kingdom and play it for a reasonable amount of hours. You can buy things. You can enjoy things. That's how it works. But the most important thing is that stewardship is an exercise of faith. It's an exercise of faith. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's faith, number one, that God is ultimately the owner. It is understanding and believing what God has said, that he has given these things to us as a stewardship. And second, it is faith that God will provide. It's faith that God will provide. And I'm talking specifically about Israel now, about the tithe. Tithing is an exercise of faith. And the reason why I'm saying this is because God was entitled to what he would call the first fruits. That is to say, uh, if your cow had a baby cow, first baby cow belongs to God. If your goat has a baby goat, first baby goat belongs to God. Have a tree, first fruits belongs to God. One-tenth belongs to God. All of that belongs to God. It's given directly to him as an offering. And the reason why I'm saying this is a practice of faith is because your cow may never have a baby again. Your cow may die. Your goat may die. That tree might be cut down or burnt. You don't know. To give the first of anything to God is an act of faith because you're not guaranteed anything else after that. So there was a challenge here in the principle of tithing that the people had this opportunity to exercise faith. That 
is the risk of faith. But the thing is, the way that they withheld the tithe, the way that they robbed God revealed a deeper issue. And this is why I'm making this point. The issue was not money. Yeah, they had little. Yeah, they were withholding what God deserved. They were not following the Mosaic law. That is a problem. But the real problem was their corrupted faith. The real problem was the fact that they were unwilling to believe God. Number one, that he is the creator and master and they are just stewards. And number two, that God is trustworthy, that he will provide for them. And by doing so, they stole from God. They took what was rightfully his for themselves. Tithing was only ever meant to be a token expression. For Israel and for us. Tithing is just a token expression of the believer's faith. The full faith of the believer. Now, now, I'm not trying to make light of how hard tithing can be. Look, 10% for Israel and the same for us. 10% is a lot of money. I understand that. I'm not making light of the difficulty of tithing. But keep in mind... That tithing has always ever been from what you have, not from what you don't have. That is a very important principle to keep in mind. There was no flat rate minimum that all of Israel had to observe. In the same way for us, let me convert it. There's no $10,000 minimum for tithing in the church. There's no flat rate. It is according to what you have, not what you don't have. And you can actually look at the Mosaic Law for this because God makes provisions for the families that are richer you give a cow. For the families who are less well-off, you give a goat or a lamb. If you are really less well-off, you can give God a bird. Just catch one and offer it. That's okay. If you can't even get a bird, you can offer God just straight-up flour, like bread flour. Just throw it on the altar with some oil, make pancakes with it. That's your offering. I kid you not. The system that God put in place was very equitable in the sense that it was only from what you have, not what you don't have. But the thing about the offering is, again, I'm telling you, tithing is not about money. This passage is not ultimately about money. This passage is about your worship. The offering that God wants is your faith. Look at what the psalmist says in chapter 50 of the book of Psalms. This is Asaph. He says, Uh, God says through Asaph, for every beast of the forest is mine, right? He's the creator. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness, everything in it are mine. And then God keeps going. He explains the logic. Do you think I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Rhetorical question. No, he doesn't. What does he want then? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. That is what God wants. The offering that God wants is a thankful heart. It's a heart that is obedient, a heart that depends on him, a heart that trusts him. That has always been what God has wanted. It was never about the animals. It was never about the money. It's always been about Israel. So for us this morning, I want to caution you. To beware your thieving instincts. Beware your thieving instincts. The fundamental concern of this passage is not your money, but your willingness to offer yourself. Let me say it again. God's concern this morning is not ultimately your money, but yourself. Because Jesus didn't die for your money. Jesus died for you. What portion of yourself do you withhold from God? What part of your life do you withhold from God? What part of your heart do you withhold from God? Growing up, my parents had this custom of closing doors in the house. And I think there was this, unex- this unspoken understanding among all the families in the Chinese church that I grew up in that when someone invites you over to their house, you do not open closed doors. Now, the practical reason was because they were embarrassed of how my room looked. There were things that you just don't want people to see. But it's the idea that when you invite guests over, it's very simple. Just close the door if you don't want them going in. Do you treat God as a guest? What doors do you keep closed in your house? 
What doors do you keep closed in your life? What area of your life do you not want God to step into? Let me give you a few examples. The first one, obviously, as we talk about this passage, is money. Will you withhold money from God? Because the thing is, even though this passage, the ultimate concern is not about money, money is a part of it. It is a representation. As I said before, it is a token expression of your faith. If you are unwilling to trust God with your money, then you're withholding it from him. If you're unwilling to tithe, assuming you have an income, you're withholding it from him. You are putting your faith in money. You are choosing to use money only on your own terms and not for God. You could ask a step further. On what are you willing to spend money? Will you only spend it on yourself? Will you only spend it in a way that you deem is the most fiscally, fiscally responsible? Or will you be generous with people? Would you be willing to sacrifice your lifestyle that you want so that you can be more generous? And what I mean is this. On the one hand, your money is yours. God has entrusted it to you as a stewardship. But there is this very common dream among crossroaders that I've noticed in my time with them that they all want to own a single family house in the Bay Area. Us older people know that you can't. You just can't. But there's this dream that they're going to make 300K right off the bat and they're going to marry another person who also makes 300K and then they're going to buy a single family house in their first year. They would never say it so bluntly. But there's this undercurrent that this is what it means to live comfortably. And while I'm pooping on the crossroaders, let me say that it's, it's across the board. Kids from my old youth group who are off in college, and they're coming back, and they're talking about the exact same dreams. You know why they all had the same dream? It's because their parents all say the same thing. All their parents, who all happen to be Chinese of some kind, all have the same thing. You have to get a good college degree so you can make good money and buy a good single-family house and live close to us and make grandbabies for us. They all say the same thing. What if God, in giving you 300K job, would rather you use the money in a different way? What if you would settle for a townhouse so that you can be generous to other people? What if you would settle for even less so that you can be generous to other people? There are different ways to look at money. But the big question is, if you refuse to even consider the possibility that you should not be as comfortable as you think you deserve to be, then you are withholding that from God. Will you only have sex on your own terms? The issue of pornography is people want sex on their own terms. That's what it is. You want it at, at your time, in your looks, in the way that you want it, how you want it. It doesn't matter about the morality of it. The same goes for sex in any other setting besides the loving relationship between husband and wife. The thing is, people want things on their own terms. Sex is a good thing when it is enjoyed in God's way. In the same thing that just friendships are good things when they are enjoyed in God's way. But when we make an idol of friendship, when we make an idol of our choice, when we make an idol of opportunity, whatever thing that you would like to have on your own terms instead of submitting it to God, that is what you're withholding from God. Now, for those of you who might be not believers or just very young in your faith, there is this common idea that to be a Christian is a lot of giving up. There is a lot of giving up. There are so many rules that you have to follow, so many more things that you can't do that honestly you like, but you just can't do it if you were to take Christianity seriously. There is this idea that you are more free if you're not a Christian. Let me dispel that myth for you. The Apostle Peter says to us that if you are overcome by something, you are enslaved to it. Notice this is just the flip side of the coin that we just talked about. If there's anything that you are unwilling to give up to God, then you're withholding it from him. But the big question is, on the other side, why do you hold it so tightly? Why can't you let it go? Could it be 
that it's not that you're holding it on so tightly, but it's holding you. Could it be that you are a slave to this dream of living in a certain kind of comfort, a certain kind of income level? Could it be that you are enslaved to this idea that you ought to have sex however you want it? Could it be that you are a slave to your sex organ? You are not free. You are just a slave to a God of your own choosing. Whatever God you have chosen, that's what you're enslaved to. You're not free. Believer, you are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. But God is sacred. Let's move forward. God calls his people to repentance. He calls us to steward our lives faithfully. The first thing that we get to consider is we have to recognize God's patience. Look with me in verses 6 and 7. We're going to recognize God's patience. God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statues and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. This statement of God's unchanging nature is specifically focused on how he keeps his promises. He's talking about his promises, how he doesn't change. This is what we call covenant faithfulness. He is unwilling to break his promises. See what the psalmist says in Psalm 89, verse 34. Let's get that on the screen. Psalm 89, verse 34. If we have it. Did I not put it up there? If not, I will read it from my Bible. I must have made a mistake. I'm sorry. Psalm 89, verse 34. The psalmist says this. God says, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. God will not change his mind. When he has made a promise, he will keep that promise. He will never change it. Now, let's think about how God has been patient with them. Because God says, the reason why you have not been destroyed, consumed, is because I don't change. God doesn't change. He's been patient with them. Let me just put this in terms of years. Ever since the Exodus, 1445 BC, ever since the Exodus, God has been patient with Israel. From the time of the Exodus, 1445, all the way to the Babylonian exile, 586 BC, it, has all, it was 800 years of patience because God kept saying, look, Guys, we made an agreement. We have a covenant together. You live in this way, I will treat you this way. If you live badly, I will curse you in that way. That's the Mosaic covenant. That's Deuteronomy 28 and 29. That's how it works. But the thing is, the curses took so long to come out. God was so patient with them. He kept on doing good for them. He kept on trying to bring them back to himself through the prophets, through blessings. 800 years before God finally threw them out. But even then he wasn't done with them because God brought them back. God was going to restore them. And now we find ourselves around 400 BC for Malachi and they're exactly the same. They didn't learn the lesson. They're just like their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents. They are the same. God is still so patient with them. The problems that they have in this letter are the exact same problems that Israel has always had. So God calls them to repentance. God calls them to turn away from sin. You are a slave to your sin, so turn away from it and trust me instead. What do you think this sin is going to give you? And the way that they would express repentance in this part of the letter is just bring the full tithe in. Just bring the full tithe in. Remember that the tithe is just a token expression of faith. It's not about the money. It's about their faith. But if they are unwilling to trust God with their money, then that is one part of their life that they are unwilling to give to God. But when you see God's patience, the way that God put up with them for a literal millennium and still held on to them, we are tempted to take advantage of his patience, and that's why we have to respond rightly to his patience. We have to make sure that we respond rightly to his patience. God's not finished with you this morning. 
God's not done with you. You may realize in a moment of lucidity as you think about your own life that you have been the same person your entire life. That you struggle with the same things your entire life. That at root, it has always been pride and anger and lust and envy or some variation of the Catholic seven, whatever you want it to be, all right? It's always been the same because the thing is, a lot of times we never deal with those things. We never get it down to the root level. We just deal with surface manifestations that bother us or bother people that matter to us. And so we cut those things off without actually dealing with the sin issue at the root. But God is not finished with you. He hasn't given up. See how God is still patient with you, even though you doubt him in the same ways week after week, even though you struggle with the exact same thing and there has been no progress week after week. God has been patient with you. You know why I know that? Because you're still here. Because he hasn't struck you down. The fact that you and I wake up and breathe in the morning is a clear sign of God's patience. In the same way that God didn't strike Adam and Eve down immediately in the garden, even though he could have. In the same way that God was patient with Paul as he tried to tear down the church, God is patient with us. The fact that we have another day to breathe is a proof of God's patience. And so I want to tell you, don't presume on his patience. Don't expect it to last forever because tomorrow is not promised. You may not wake up with breath in the morning the next day. So today is the day that you need to repent. Don't believe the lie that you can just wait until you get your life together before you finally live for God. Let me just take care of my undergrad and my graduate and pay off all my loans after working 10 years at a job. And then when I'm ready, I will put my faith in God. God, that's not how it works. That's the pride of life. That's the pride of life the Apostle John talks about. When you think that you can live life on your own terms, when you are the God of your existence, when you get to decide how you will live, that is just the pride of life. Let's take it back to tithing as, again, a pertinent example. I'll tithe after I reach a certain level of financial stability. That is to say, you set an arbitrary number for your retirement account, your checking account, uh, whatever other savings accounts you have, and uh, your fund stock account. You set a minimum level, and after you reach those things, then you'll start tithing. Where's your confidence? Where have you put your faith? Is your faith not in money? Is your faith not in your ability to get money? The way that we handle money, guys, shows where our faith is. And so that's why this is a very poignant example that God is bringing up for Israel because he's hitting them where it hurts. This should hit us where it hurts too. Because if we show by the way that we manage money that our faith is not in God, then that is a problem. And today is the day that we need to get back to God, return to him. He'll return to you. Money is personal. And money is a stewardship. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, which I really think I put up in there. There it is. Paul says, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. There is a lot of body of doctrine on money in scripture. I just chose this one because it's very easy to understand and it summarizes things very well. Paul explains, what's the purpose of money? Why do we get money to begin with? You will be enriched in every way. For what purpose? To be generous in every way. Let me bring this back to generosity again. If you want to challenge yourself, To handle money in the way that God wants you to, be generous. Be willing to cut down on how you live for yourself so that you can be generous to other people. It is a stewardship. Support the ministry of our church. Support the poor. Support the needy. Support anyone who needs support. Use your wisdom and direct your money in that way. And you will see how challenging but how rewarding it is to put your faith in God as you steward money. We saw the indictment. Stop thief. 
We saw God's grace in the call to repentance to steward our lives faithfully. And lastly, see how God continues to be generous. He promises blessing. And I want to invite you this morning to savor God's generosity. Savor his generosity. And the first way that we do that is to remember God's generosity. See how God talks to Israel at this point. You would think after a millennium, dealing with them for so long, God would just be over them. And God would just withhold blessing and just be like, look, guys, come on. Like, I've, I've given you everything. Just get it together. But see how God continues to bless them in verses 9 through 12. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for a blessing until there is no more need. See, as a consequence of their disobedience, there was a curse. That's what we see in verse 9. And the easy way to understand this is this was the Mosaic curse. Deuteronomy 28, 29. If you disobey, there will be curses for disobedience. That's all you have to know. And some of the specific curses were your crops. If you disobey, your crops will be cursed. If you are obedient, then God will bless your crops. But notice how as a motivator for repentance, God actually promises blessing in verse 10. The crazy thing that I want to draw out, in the second half of verse 10, second sentence, he says, and thereby put me to the test. Now, those of us who grew up in church know that you are not supposed to put God to the test. That's an explicit commandment. And that's the literary irony that God is bringing out here. Notice that as the people have brought up their complaints in Malachi, they actually sound just like Israel, just like the Exodus generation, you don't love us. How have you loved us? Prove it in the same way that the Exodus generation said, God, why'd you bring us out to the desert to die? You obviously don't care about us. Let's go back to Egypt. The pattern that you're supposed to see when God says, thereby put me to the test. You're supposed to see they have been putting God to the test. They have been complaining. They've been grumbling just like Israel in the wilderness. And now God is saying, look, if you're going to keep putting me to the test, Put me to the test in the right way. See if I won't be faithful. See if I won't grant my promises exactly like I gave them in the covenant. He is inviting them instead of challenging him to experience him. He's inviting them instead of always grumbling and wrestling with him to actually experience his generosity given through obedience. If I can put it another way, God is saying, See that being faithful is actually worth it. See that trusting me is actually worth it. In the same way that tithing is just a token expression of our faith, these earthly blessings were just a token expression of God's generosity. Because you and I know that the most important things are not the blessings that we get in this life, monetary blessings, relational blessings, and you and I know that even though God does give those things to us, because God is good to everyone, God shows his generosity most clearly at the cross when he gave his one and only son for us so that whoever believes in him would never perish and have eternal life. We know that it is in Jesus that God will show us the immensity of his kindness toward us eternally, forever, without bottom, without ever running out. It is in Christ that we can experience the full generosity of God. Trust him to be generous to you because he has already proven his generosity to you. See what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He says, God who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let me explain this in plain English to you. If God didn't hold back that thing that was most important to him, that is to say, Jesus, his son, if God didn't withhold that which was most important, what else would we hold back from you? Why would he ever keep any good thing from you if he has already given you the thing that is most valuable to him. Paul's logic is, there's nothing. 
There is no truly good thing that God would ever hold back from you. So you can know with full confidence that if God chooses to withhold a good thing that you want, there is something better for you. There's a good reason behind it. I mentioned before that there is this misconception that being a Christian is all about the things you have to give up. And I said that's not the case. You will have to sacrifice things. You will. But you will never outdo God in generosity. You will never, ever, as a believer, outdo God in generosity. You will never give up more than what he has given for you. So I want to encourage you to trust him to be generous to you, to trust him to be good to you, to provide for you. And by doing so, if you can trust him to be generous to you, you can freely give yourself to him. You can give God everything that belongs to him. That is to say, you can give him yourself everything that you are, because that's what God wanted all along, because Jesus loved you and gave himself, not for your money, but for you. Let's pray. God, we ask this morning for much grace. Help us to see your generosity clearly, most clearly in your son, but also in all the other ways that you've been patient with us and kind to us and generous with us. Help us to see these things clearly and through that, God, motivate us to trust you more fully. Help us to not withhold any part of ourselves back from you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Theo, for that message. If we can all stand as we sing a song in response um, to the sermon this morning. My worth is not in what I own, yeah, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in him no other My soul is satisfied in him alone As summer flowers we fade and die Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by But life eternal calls to us at the cross I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross and I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in Him no other, my soul is satisfied in Him alone. Two wonders here that I confess My worth and my unworthiness My value fixed, my ransom paid 
at the cross and I rejoice in my Redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of my soul and I will trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him alone let's sing that one more time I rejoice and I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. You're dismissed. I love you. See you next Sunday. Uh, sorry, Daniels will see you next Sunday. I won't be here. Ha 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 ha.